afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, today's Building the Future session. Uh, I am Rob Valentine. I'm director for Bruntwood, one of the UK's leading regional property companies with over 40 years' experience in creating thriving cities. Bruntwood is a company who invests in, long, in the long term, creating places for businesses to innovate, grow and succeed. Bruntwood aligns itself with the economic strategy of our cities and recognises that by working together with major institutions, public sector and key stakeholders is absolutely paramount to the success of our city and in our city region. Our universities are clearly at the heart of this and Birmingham is already home to 18 leading dynamic and progressive universities, some of which will be uh, uh, fortunately presenting with us today. Uh, at Bruntwood, we recognise how universities play a crucial role in attracting talent and investment to the region. Uh, they, all, they are a driving force behind innovation, uh, with their expertise being recognised uh, locally and globally. Our support of the universities is already shown through our partnership with Aston University and Birmingham City University, both leaders in their own fields, I see this as being integral to the ecosystem that we're looking to build with the expansion of Innovation Birmingham that I talked about earlier. Our proposals, our proposed future innovation district will be a place where new business and talent can grow and flourish, as well as a natural home for university graduates and university spin-out companies. We understand the pivotal role that universities are going to play within the region, the great ideas that are already, already being generated and we want to continue this dialogue with them and to build on this support. Today, we'll be having the opportunity to hear from six leading universities showcasing their most innovative research that tackle real-world issues, such as ageing populations, connectivity, and helping business to tackle technological advances. It therefore gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speakers. And to begin with, you will be hearing from Dr. Uh, Anne Kofopoulos of Coventry University, uh, followed by Anthony Metcalf of the University of Birmingham, Dr. Victoria Lush from Aston University, Dr. Mate Frutos Pascal from Birmingham City University, Professor Mohamed Arif from the University of Wolverhampton, and Alison Meir from the University of Warwick. I would like to pass over to the first speaker, Dr. Anne Kofopoulos, who will be presenting on intelligent healthcare and how we respond to the regional challenges. I'll just get the, uh, the slide up. Are we there? Yeah, okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much for giving up your part of your lunch time to, uh, to come and listen to, to myself and my colleagues here. Um, and it's um, a really um, great pleasure that I'm here today to talk to you about um, responding to regional challenges, intelligent healthcare. Now, I have to confess, I didn't actually make that title myself, intelligent healthcare. It was actually designed um, in, in sort of in collaboration with, um, with a colleague. And, um, and when I was thinking about the title, I thought, intelligent healthcare, what do I actually mean by that in response to what I'm going to talk to you about for the next five minutes? And essentially, what I'd like to get out of, of speaking to you this afternoon is how um, at Coventry University we're responding to the challenges being presented, particularly for those within the healthcare sector um, and working within the NHS, but also within, within other health um, and social care sectors. And how do we bring intelligence, so not only the intelligence of um, academia and university, um, themselves, but also the, uh, the intelligence of industry and business working together. Because any of you that have perhaps worked with universities will understand perhaps the myriad of, um, of, of areas that you perhaps negotiate when you're, when, you're, when you're drawing up what you're going to work with. But it's actually how do we bridge that gap between academics um, and industry. So um, really that's the challenge for, for intelligent healthcare, particularly around um, the digitisation of um, the health professions. And hence why I'm going to just focus on our, um, our, our really um, uh, area of Institute of Coding, which is about developing healthcare professionals for the future. 
and driving growth in the West Midlands. So we're very, um, we're very fortunate that we are the, one of the five leads for the Institute of Coding, which was announced by Theresa May um, early this year, and um, which was really concerned with um, the whole national picture of the high UK demand um, for, for digital specialists and based on the Shadbolt review, which was largely to do with computing graduates, um, that the many of them, that even though they have digital skills and computing skills, they're very much not employed um, upon graduation. And so in light of the UK industrial strategy, there's a much a ready need for the workforce with digital skills at level six and seven. And really, this, this does translate to other sectors. So how, how are we future-proofing future our workforce um, for digitization and digital skills, um, ensuring that we, that we maintain time for patient care and that digital, um, those digital skills don't take over that, but they enhance the patient care and the patient journey. So the, the objectives of the Institute of Coding are very much about um, transforming employment outcomes for level six and seven and making sure that we equip learners for the future. So it's about mapping out with industry what those skills are, what those digital skills are that are needed within the healthcare sector in particular, as well as the automotive sector um, and other areas that, that we are focusing upon. And it's about creating new innovative learning and teaching models. So there is that traditional um, classroom-based model, but how do we, how do we spread bite-sized chunks of 15, 30 minutes of learning for people who are working in industry and um, who are working in the healthcare sector and don't necessarily have time? And also um, constraints within budgets, who are redu constantly reducing budgets in terms of learning beyond registration, and how can we come up with new flexible ways of working? So it's a very new area in the sense of, because um, it's only just, it's only just really taking shape. And if you can see on the, um, on the slide here, we have um, there's five um, major um, partners and it's led, led essentially by the University of Bath. But we are, um, we're one of them that are very much leading on the digitization um, and healthcare skills and also how do we develop those workplace skills. So it's um, digital, digitalization of the professions for Coventry University. We're a member of the IOC steering group because um, it has a number of other, other partners that aren't named um, on there. And if anybody wants a bit of a fuller presentation, then they're welcome to email me. I do have cards with me and you can contact me at the end. So essentially, what we're trying to, we're trying to address with digitalizing the professions is sector-specific digital skills and the direct links to, um, to healthcare and focus on modular delivery and developing very much short courses, um, short taster courses and, and continual professional development within a very much a flexible framework so people can almost take a, a pick and mix approach about what they want for their own organisation. But the biggest thing for us initially is to really a call for action because this is very much in, a, in an early stage and we're trying to look at what are the digital skills needed among your workforce. Now, there's, there's what, about 30, what, 40 people in this room at the moment, and I'm sure you all come from different sectors. So we'd be delighted to speak to people about what your needs are um, and, and what are your talent retraining programmes. And if, if you'd like to see um, what, what, what do you think the current and future digital skill trend is for your industry, what are your needs and how is the university... Um, who are looking at digitising the professions work with you because it's very much about a collaborative partnership and understanding your organisational culture and how we can embed the learning within that if that is responsive to what you need. And, um, and, and so please um, do talk to me um, at the end. I think that's my five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks to the organisers for inviting me to come this afternoon. I'm a sort of hybrid person, so I, I started as an academic and then uh, spent some time trying to spin a company out. So I actually have um, led the process of becoming a sort of SME, um, but now I'm back in academia trying to um, help those SMEs. And so at the University of uh, Birmingham, we are uh, part of the Medical Devices te uh, Testing and Evaluation Centre, but also the Healthcare Technologies Institute. And here we're trying to actually um, help SMEs navigate their way through developing healthcare technologies. And why would you do that? Well, part of it's coming up with an earlier type of diagnosis. Healthier ageing is a big thing now and um, is a really important uh, element of what we do. Better rehabilitation, improved quality of life, 
and economic benefit. So through that, you can see there's a patient journey as well as a journey for the SME. Um, medical technology sort of sits in the middle of this um, driver for innovation, which is an industrial push. So industry wants something uh, developed, but there's also a clinical pull. And Birmingham Health Partners, based at the University of Birmingham, are enabling us to establish strong links with clinicians. There's a lot of numbers there. I'm not going to go into them, but it sort of backs up what we've heard this morning about the West Midlands being a good place to try and innovate. The environment's critical. So to innovate, you need things around you that allow you to do that translational journey. So for us, it was the opening of the new Queen Elizabeth Hospital at Birmingham. We have there the Surgical Reconstruction and Microbiological Research Centre. We have the Royal Centre for Defence Medicine. So actually, sometimes defence actually drives innovation. And we have a lot of multidisciplinary research events, and that helps us to break down barriers, bringing SMEs in, bringing clinicians, bringing patients in, the most important set of people in the equation, but also embracing new areas of research, transferring those technologies between those areas, generating solutions for real problems. Our unique USE, USP um, is the Institute of Translational Medicine, the blob in orange there, but within a square mile, we have everything that we need to do to translate. We have the uh, clinicians at the hospital and the women's hospital. We have the main campus of the university. So there are five or six of us at MD Tech, but in fact, we can get uh, the greater University of Birmingham colleagues to come and answer any kind of questions that you might have. Developing a technology also has its own problems. And, you know, I presented this very simple industrial push, clinical pull, but actually there are lots of other considerations that we've got to take on board. Manufacturing considerations, regulation, IP, and cost. And engaging with stakeholders early on and getting some of these things actually sort of decided and developed uh, is really important. So at MD Tech, we have laboratory space, which is in the top left, and in the bottom right, you can see a surgical setup that we've got that allows us to actually carry out things in a theater with simulation being. So we can do usability studies. Um, our support capabilities, we can give advice on uh, clinical trials, um, designing experiments to determine uh, product feasibility, identifying and engaging appropriate uh, third-party companies sometimes, <coughs> Preclinical safety is a big problem um, sometimes if you're developing a, a, a device that's going to go into the body, so you've got to think about that sterilization too. We're building really great relationships with um, the regulators, so the MHRA now have um, advisory meetings that you can go to and go and talk to them, go and actually get some early understanding. And so we have this sort of iterative process of having a characterization service in the lab, but also usability. What will the two uh, situations lead to? Well, hopefully MD Tech and HDI together will develop medical innovation. Training for scientists is really important, so that next generation that's coming through of engineers, clinicians, scientists, we need to actually develop them and make them understand what it is to actually commercialize something. Outreaching across the regions and helping to hopefully drive the local life science economy um, and regional growth. So within MD Tech, you can access uh, state-of-the-art facilities and collaborate with universities and hospitals through funded European support. Um, MD Tech and HDR, I, I, basically the cost of that environment for a small SME, some of the kit that we have, you just couldn't afford to do. So there's value of expertise, hopefully reduction in the risk, and we can give you some advice on how to try and commercialize. So we have a stand out there, so you're more than welcome to come and see me or Alex who's at the back, um, and we'll try and answer any questions that you might have. These are the people that have funded it and are involved, so thank you for your time. <clears throat> okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Victoria Lush, and I'm a research fellow at Aston University working in computer science department as part of Think Beyond Data Initiative. So as some of you may know, Aston University is located in the heart of Birmingham. And Birmingham is a very commercial and industry-oriented city. And Aston University has a lot of connections to businesses. We're trying to support local businesses. We're working with bigger companies as well as trying to create new collaborations. So we're working with SMEs, and as well, we're working with major hospitals uh, that are around us. 
One interesting thing about Aston University is that you will struggle to find a university more attuned to the needs of businesses and industry. And this is true throughout my history of being in Aston University for the last 10 years. I've been involved in a variety of projects, working with small industrial partners, with massive industrial organizations, uh, with major hospitals, supporting and creating new collaborations within Birmingham as well as West Midlands. But today what I want to discuss is artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence is actually connected to healthcare and how it can help to develop healthcare and support society. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, we might think of humanoid droids that might, might one day walk among us and look like people. What we're facing at the moment is humanoid robots that can actually support people and provide, facilitate our needs. We also have a stand in the main hall and you can actually interact with one of the now robots uh, if you wish. When we talk about artificial intelligence, we might also think about the systems such as AlphaGo that in 2017 beat one of the best Go players and Go game is actually harder than chess even though it has quite simple rules. But what does it actually mean? All of these advances in artificial intelligence, all of these advances in machine learning technologies, what does it mean for small businesses as well as healthcare? What we as an institution noticing is that AI, machine learning and visual analytics actually changing the face of businesses. It is changing how businesses work, it is changing how we interact with technology and we as a university trying to support local businesses to actually have this smooth transition from manual processes to automation, to adaptive AI and machine learning techniques. How can AI actually help us? Not just businesses, but healthcare. We can automate and scale different processes. So something that's been done on paper before, we can turn it into automated systems. We can provide better solutions for the companies. We can provide better solutions for the actual doctors. What a better solution means depends on the actual client. It depends on the actual company. Better solution might mean one thing to one person and a completely different thing to another person. We can provide deeper insight and more accessible ways to analyze data and understand data. And for that, we might apply visual analytics combined with machine learning techniques. But taking all of this on board, how do we actually provide these services to the local hospitals as well as local SMEs. I could give a number of examples of work that we are conducting with local companies and hospitals, but I will focus on just two. So robotherapy, and we've got a stand outside the, where we can talk about this in more detail, is a project run by two academics in our department uh, where we work with children as well as elderly people to analyze improvements in their condition. So as a clinician, a person might not notice small changes in deterioration as well as improvements, whereas robotic technology can recognize those much faster, as well as it will reduce the actual pressure on the healthcare where we can provide these technologies at home. Another project that I am directly involved with is actually mental health, where we're using augmented reality and virtual reality tools to provide better access to mental health facilities. And it's not just information about mental health, it's actually AI tools that can help you to self-assess and self-manage your mental health conditions. How are these projects actually supported? Well, as I mentioned before, I am part of this Think Beyond Data initiative, which is 1.7 million pounds EU funded project that is focused purely on helping small and medium enterprises. 
uh, we have a group of academics, including me, working in machine learning, AI, and data analytics, providing absolutely free consultancies to businesses, trying to support local community and providing new insights in technologies. Thank you very much. Hello. Yeah. Okay. So, hello. My name is Maite Frutos, and I'm a research fellow at Birmingham City University. So, I'm here to present our work in freehand interaction in augmented and virtual reality. That meaning that we enable grasping in augmented and, real and virtual reality, which actually means that if you are presented with a virtual object in front of you, you will be able to actually get your hand to it, grab it, and move it as if it, as if it was a real object. That type of interaction is actually not being supported by any health set manufacturer or software company at the moment. So as a brief introduction to my background, I work with sen tracking sensors and data analysis and adaptive systems, and my whole background is in that. And I also sit in the main committees for augmented reality. Um, at the Digital Media Technology Lab, where, is, uh, where I'm based, uh, we work in the main three uh, spectrum, uh, areas of digital media, bas um, basically image processing and mixed reality, digital audio processing and digital media distribution. We are nine research staff and 13 full-time PhD students, give or take, because the PhD student number changes a lot. And uh, we work in a wide range of applications with industry in the domains of AR, MR through healthcare and music production. So um, we started our is, yeah. we started our hand interaction um, expertise by actually working with virtual reality TV studios. If you think of when on election night, when we have the TV presenter interaction, interacting with the poll data from the results for the elections and where we have the weather forecast, where you actually see a, a person actually uh, interacting with virtual content, uh, we were interested to see which is actually the, the main error that you can introduce from an audience perspective and the main error that you can introduce from a first person perspective to actually make this very interact interactive, natural, intuitive, and enabling a, a proper experience for the audience. So that's how we started working with freehand, no wearables interaction. Um, from there, we realized that actually there was a need for moving on to how people actually perceive and analyze uh, and perceive the objects and interact with them in these type of scenarios. And we created a, an application case for um, enabling healthcare education using this type of interaction, where actually an uh, educator can interact with virtual content, very naturally showcase it and make it uh, lectures and lessons more intuitive and interactive. Um, currently, these type of technologies are being used in industry for training workforces, especially in engineering industries, like the automotive, aerospace, and manufacturing companies are using virtual reality solutions for training their workers in a safe environment. The problem is at the moment that they use the virtual reality headset available in the market, which usually came with two handset controllers. And that creates an abstraction level that it doesn't really match with what you are actually required to do in a proper training scenario, where you actually want your workers to do the same task in the same level of they will do it in the real life. So that's what we are aiming to, and that's what we are working for. Uh, from this type of uh, third-person interaction, we move on to the use of headsets like the Microsoft HoloLens or the MetaChu. And we've been working since then from a very, from a very fundamental level, uh, trying to first understand how users perform and how users use them, and then evolving the interaction paradigms from there. So we are currently looking at grasping in virtual reality. And uh, this is one of our latest um, user studies where we are actually asking people to manipulate virtual objects in the, in the way that they feel is more natural. And we are uh, taking some measurements behind the scenes of how they actually move the objects, how they grasp it, where they grasp it, and what type of grasp interaction they are using. 
Uh, we've been publishing for the last seven years in the main uh, AR uh, events and journals, and we are currently working with industry, with Holosphere, ESK, and Jaguar Land Rover in augmented reality and virtual reality projects. And yeah, you have my contact details there, and we have a stand outside as well. So. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Professor Mohammed Arif. I am the head of school at School of Architecture, Built Environment uh, at University of Wolverhampton. And today I'm here to talk about a new research center that we have in the area of brownfield research. So one of the challenges of this region is lots of derelict sites lying all over the place. And they are not being developed because people don't know enough about what brownfield is. And those who do know enough about what brownfield is, they don't want to venture in that territory because it just delays the development process. You have to deal with, with brownfield, you have to remediate it, and you have to bring it back to a condition where it can be used. So the challenges are immense. However, if you look at opportunities in this area, we have Commonwealth Games not too far from uh, now. Uh, we have housing shortage. We have projects like transportation links. All of these are huge, huge initiatives, which, whether you like it or not, would involve dealing with brownfield land, okay? Because there isn't enough land to, to go around and, and, and address all these challenges. So what this research center does is we are funded by Black, Black Country Lab. So our focus at the moment is Black Country SMEs. And we are dealing with SMEs that do pretty much anything in Brownfield. Because at the university, we have expertise in soil and soil remediation. We have expertise in building scanning. We just bought a very expensive scanner, and as head of school, when I have to spend that much money, you know, my heartbeat does go up, okay? And we, we are just looking at some very high-end ground-penetrating radars. So, so if you look at, and we, we just uh, ordered some drones, so we are, we are going really high-tech, you know, in, in brownfield remediation. In addition to that, we have expertise in planning laws, and environmental laws, which, which are quite important. We are looking at social aspects of brownfield development. We are looking at construction management related aspects of brownfield development. So the services we offer, you know, we have, we have, we are creating a GIS database of all the sites in black country at least and we plan to move that initiative further to West Midlands region because at the moment we are funded by the Black Country Lab. Uh, we, we are looking at different uses of soil and we have our own greenhouse where we, we play with, with you know, different applications of soil. Uh, building scanning, I have two of my researchers who are experts in building scanning. So if you have, because Remember, brownfield is not all about dirty sites. It's also about derelict buildings. So you need to, to scan them and, and bring them back to use. Now, we are looking at viability and business models. So we are looking at all the three aspects of sustainability, social, economic, and environmental. Now, we, are mo we have created the database, and if anyone wants to come and see our database, we are, we are uh, happy to show them. The last thing is now we are is starting a big initiative to move our Brownfield Research Center into a national Brownfield Institute, which will have three elements. It will have a policy center, it will have an R&D facility, and it will have physical testing facilities for industry. So basically, we'll be doing all three aspects of brownfield, policy, uh, testing, and research. And, and we have a stall outside. We have researchers there. I'll be here for 
for a few minutes after the, the presentations, but we have two researchers who should be there. If you want to get in touch with me, just let me have your card, or if I'm not here, them, let them have your card and, and, and they, will, they will get in touch. So, well, thank you very much. Thanks for your attention. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Alison Meir. I'm the Business Development Manager at WMG at the University of Warwick. What I wanted to tell you, you've, t you've heard a little bit about uh, battery uh, technology today, but I wanted to add to that and let you know what WMG is doing to really help the UK government deliver for its strategy on future mobility and zero emissions, and really how WMG is helping to position the Midlands as really the leading centre in the UK for battery innovation. So basically, um, uh, against the backdrop of, of climate change and energy security, the government has invested significantly. So it's moving its R&D spend from 1.7 to 2.4 GDP by 2027. It's going to have a transition to zero emissions by 2050. So of the 4.7 billion, which I'm sure you're all aware of for the industrial strategy challenge, 246 million of that was um, earmarked for the Faraday battery challenge. And in actual fact, WNG played a major part in really setting the scene together with the Automotive, Automotive Council to present the case to the government for creating the, battery, uh, the Faraday Battery Challenge. So what WMG's vision is to really develop UK capability to position the UK on the world stage and really help all those uh, businesses seize the opportunity that's presented by electrification, which is going to be nearly six billion by 2025. And also we want to help deliver the skills which will underpin those capabilities. Sorry, right, skipping a... There we go, sorry. <laughs> so what are the challenges? So these eight parameters were what was set to the government, a little bit of scene setting, um, and these are the challenges that really determine and shape our research and development direction at WMG. So for each of them, we've got um, cost, energy, power density, safety, first life, temperature, predictability and recyclability. For all of those parameters, we really need to improve them. Cost, we obviously need to drive down. Energy and power, we need to increase those. Safety, we really need to eliminate thermal runaway. First life is about eight years for automotive at the moment, but we really need to extend that. So again, we drive the cost down. Temperature ranges need to be as far as possible to accommodate all sectors. This is not just automotive. All the other sectors are getting on board. Obviously, automotive has the volume behind it, but all the other sectors are joining in the fight for electrification. And predictability. Predictability is a major part of where we're at. We really need to understand how those batteries perform. We need to be able to predict them. And finally, recyclability. Now, we're nowhere near there yet, but by 2035, we really need to get to, uh, to 95%. So recyclability is a major part. So how do we get there? So WMG is really the leading research and development organisation for battery innovation in the UK at the moment. It has over £60 million invested in our Energy Innovation Centre, and we do everything at, at WMG in the Energy Innovation Centre. We move from raw materials to electrochemistry to cell pack and module level. We do assembly, we do forensics, and we take it right the way through to the other end, and that's um, uh, recycling and second use. And twinned with that is our work with our electric motors and power electronics team. And underpinning the whole thing is a control and systems integration piece. So really understanding and doing the modeling and simulation behind the electrification is really, really what's, what's needed. And we have an unparalleled depth and breadth of capability at WMG, which is unique in the UK and really unique almost in Europe for what we have. So our recent expansion, um, we're very lucky. We've been uh, we're just in the last sections of our £20 million upgrade um, by, funded by ERA, which is another Midlands innovation. So ERA is six Midland universities together with the British Geological Society, which combine together to really make the Midlands a centre for energy innovation. So we're just in the last stages of our final um, upgrades. We now have absolutely state-of-the-art um, battery testing facilities. We have one megawatt testing facilities, which again is unique in the UK at the moment. I'm sure everybody's going to catch up. Um, but very much testing facilities unique to, to, to the UK. We have discovery, we have analysis. It's all there at the, uh, at the innovation centre. And what we're really trying to do, we're trying to accelerate the technologies and accelerate the opportunities for business. So we have, we have pilot lines there and we have scale-up 
facilities at WMG. They're open source facilities. So it's really for businesses to come and help seize the opportunity that the electrification agenda um, approach, um, is approaching. And really the supply chain opportunity is really we want to embrace the existing supply chain and really look at adjacent industries that, come in, that can come into play in the electrification arena. So just um, uh, looking at the industrial strategy Faraday challenge, to show you where um, WMG has really a leading position, that the 246 million um, that was uh, given for the Faraday battery challenge, that's sort of put into three different slices of about 80 million each. The first slice is looking at research, the second slice at innovation, and the last slice at scale up. So the first slice um, in, in research, the Faraday Institution, we're one of the winning, uh, the winning consortium made up of seven other universities that make up that fundamental, that institute that is looking at fundamental research. The innovation side, there's 80 million per side for Innovate UK, and Innovate UK have funded now about 40 projects, and WMG have actually been a part in 10 of those projects. So we're really a quarter of the funded projects that have happened in the first two rounds for the Faraday Challenge. We're really playing a leading role. And finally, UK BIC. So Martin Yardley already spoke a little bit about UK BIC. And we're very excited to be working with Coventry City Council and Warwickshire and Coventry LEP to create what is going to be the learning factory of the future. So this is a national independent facility to really take the UK to the next scale. We sit, the UK BIC will sit between the kilogram scale and the kiloton scale. So basically en enabling that scale up of small to mid scale businesses looking at new chemistries, new formats, new ways of manufacturing, and really taking and accelerating the opportunity for UK to get to the global position as a UK leader in electrification. If you have any other questions about battery technology, do come and uh, talk to us. We have a stand outside, um, but thank you very much for your attention. You. Well, uh, first of all, uh, a thank you to the panelists. Um, you know, five minutes each, not a, not a, lot, not a lot of time, um, but they imparted a great deal of uh, information in that, and I, and, I, and I appreciate you more or less sticking to those uh, five minute slots. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I guess I got the sense there that you know our universities are leading um, on the uh, you know, on a number of fronts in terms of some of the challenges or the many challenges that we face as a nation. And it was really heartening for me to, 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 to listen to about the breadth of research and technology that uh, we're developing uh, here in the West Midlands. And I think I, I get the sense that really will sort of empower this region if we're able to really en enhance that um, and get those connections through to business um, and really create that differentiator that, um, that, we, that we are building, but we cl clearly do need to do so much more on. So everything from me, I was fascinated to hear about brownfield land being in property myself and you know, the great work that, that's being done on that, but you know, the great challenges we've got in, in respect of healthcare and data analytics that sit around that, but actual practical robotic solutions and solutions around the, the, the issues we have around mental health care, which is, you know, unfortunately one of those social problems that we, we, we seems to be um, seems to be worsening. Um, so for, for me, very enheartened, and I'm, I'm opening up now to some questions. I've got a couple of questions I might want to ask myself, but clearly, I'll open it out to the audience first. And we've got a roving mic, I think, for my. For, Yeah, yeah, Sophie, so, yeah. <laughs> if I can summarise that, um, and, and it's not just Brookwood, I mean, it's, it's about universities, the acad academia linking up with business, so we, we, we solve real world problems. Um, great to get your take on that. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, um, I think. Still on, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question. And um, coming from a healthcare background, I'm a health professional myself. I think we've, I mean, at, in, in a lot of universities and, and in Coventry, we've got extremely good stakeholder relations with trusts and hospitals. Um, and increasingly um, out within them, the, the other health sector providers, so InterServe Healthcare, um, we do a lot of work with them in terms of PhDs. But I think traditionally, um, those sectors like so the, those areas like Bruntwood haven't engaged necessarily with health, not because they haven't wanted to, it's just not seen as something that is to do with health. 
and I think being a stakeholder in curriculum development and ongoing, not, not just um, somebody that flies in and flies out, of, uh, having a mutual collaboration together to see how, how those think how health and housing work together creatively to generate new solutions because and not working in silos, so making sure that you actually continue that working together rather than it just being a one-off project. And I'd be really welcome to that because it gives a very different perspective, but also around things like technology as well and how that's used and how you can bring those two areas together. So I'd be very keen to, to look at that. And, and regarding you know, your, your question about Brownfield, so the Brownfield Research Center we have at Wolverhampton, uh, it is an SME support center. So any SME that has any requirement, any need, we have to assist them for free. Okay, so that's a free, free service. But there is one more thing that I would like to say, you know, because industry academia collaboration in general comes up a lot and, and there are lots of people who come to us and say, well, I have this problem. But there is also a little bit of, shall I say, lack of patience in industry because in most cases, they want a boxed solution, yeah. okay? So I am coming, sitting across the desk and asking a question, and I want you to give me a box which will solve all my problems, okay? Unfortunately, in research, sometimes there is a time lag because your problem might be so unique that it has never been investigated, and maybe the three, four solutions we suggest, only one of them will work for you, and we need to have some sort of experimentation before we can suggest that. So, so I think you know there is also that aspect that I see a lot in industry is for R&D, it does take a little bit of time. It shouldn't take forever, but it does take a little bit more and not everything is a box solution. Okay, do we have any more questions from the audience? I have a couple of questions, and um, you know we're going to be talking later on about inclusive economic growth and the skills agenda. Perhaps two of the biggest challenges that uh, Birmingham and the, and the West Midlands face. Um, clearly, the universities have a role to play in that, um, and I just it'd be interesting. You know, I'm not wishing to. I appreciate that you have your specialities, but it would just be get your candid view in respect of where you think the universities can play into that and how they can support the, um, those, two, those two agendas. Somebody else want to go? Well, I can, I can start. You know, about two years ago, I was at an event, construction industry event, in Birmingham. And there was this very high profile speaker who is a politician and who started telling his story. And he said, well, my father was a bricklayer, and he didn't want me to use my hand to earn a living. So he said, use your brain and become a politician, okay? And everyone applauded, but unfortunately, that is th the main issue there, is people take professions where they don't want to use their hands, and especially in profession like construction, okay? But they think that universities will give them something where they only have to use their brain, not use their brain, use their hand using their brain. You see, you know, so, so I think, I think there is a higher emphasis in universities on skills development. Knowledge for knowledge's sake is not, not professed anymore at universities. And, and, and universities are also producing graduates that are as skillful as they are knowledgeable, okay? So I think, I think that aspect is changing and we are in a knowledge economy where you need both. So yeah. things are changing, but still that industry academia collaboration needs to be yeah. explored further for that to happen even more. Yep. Well, I think it's also driven by industry too, to a certain extent, what it is that they think is a shortcoming of the workforce coming out. Yep. So actually I think industry and academia should be talking more closely, maybe even get industry involved in giving master classes within a university and actually as part of a sort of entrepreneurial apprenticeship type courses, more vocational rather than just purely theoretical. Yeah, yeah. Does anybody want to add to it? 
and, and I think, um, I mean, we at WMG, we do a lot of, which I'm sure the other universities do as well, we do a lot of bespoke um, solutions for industry. So obviously there's the general skills that you can present across the board, but equally there's, there's, there's companies that will come to us with a particular problem and we'll create a bespoke module or several bespoke modules or a short course that specifically identifies their need or, in fact, a whole engineering course. So we've just, a recent one we've done with the Dyson for an engineering management course, which is done at Dyson but using our academics. And I'm sure the rest of the universities do that, that as well. I think the more that we talk to industry, the, yeah, more, yeah. the more we discover their needs and how we can best accommodate them. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I, I get the sense, I've been talking to a lot of universities in, in the region, that, that perhaps we're better, better out at reaching out and forming that collaborative approach than, than perhaps other uh, areas within, within the nation. Um, and I think that could be a you know, real competitive advantage. Uh, that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's my sense. Uh, but I think it's also incumbent on, on, on industry to, 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 it's not just the universities. We in business need to be reaching out to forming a collaboration and working through some real solutions to, to, to real problems. What, um, can I add something? You can, what, yeah. what we do in Austin University, we opened up an industry club where we invite uh, SMEs as well as large companies to join that club and help us develop the programs, so we asking them what kind of skills do they want from our students, as well as we have open days and demonstration days, such as collaboration with showcasing our research and showcasing what our students can do. And those who are within that industry club, and they pay a small fee to actually help us organize all of those events, they get a selection of our best students. So what we're trying to do is bring more companies on board, get their opinion of what exactly they want and what skills we should be developing, as well as providing them not just with services, but opening up their eyes to research and development. And what I found personally quite amazing, because I've been going to a lot of uh, similar events, is you come in and you present yourself as Aston University, and people ask you, so are you here for teaching? And there is no, there is no understanding that we also do research on yeah. top of it. And I, I think I'm just following on from my colleagues here. It's about using the technology, so like the Internet of Things. So, because many people here will be from industry, you haven't maybe got time to come in for half a day to a university to sit um, with academics. But actually, how do you use, how do we use the, the, the technology in order to, to gain your insight? And actually, what is it that you want from a university? So how, but how can we do that in a very easy, facilitative way that enables you to still do your job and to run the business, but actually to work with, work with the university? And I think, I think that's important because not ever, that time is so precious, isn't it? Okay. Uh, sorry, just one. Yeah, one more point. One I, I just think because the technology landscape is now changing so fast, that it's changing so fast, and actually the school space is not keeping up, and that's what we really need to make sure that we do. Mm. I mean, just to use electrification example, we just don't have enough electrical engineers. We really need to make sure that that school space is really, really doing what it needs to to enable the agility of the technology landscape to continue going in the way that it's going because it's just moving very fast at the moment. So we need to keep up. Okay. Well, we'll wrap up that. Um, fascinating. Um, I've learned a lot. I hope you have too. I think we should thank our panellists one more time.